In the past few videos, we came to this conclusion, that for the case where the energy level is smaller than zero, then for the direct delta potential, the xi of x is equal to this with this allowed energy level. So now we're going to consider the second case where the energy level is larger than zero. So recall that the case that we just saw previously corresponds to the case where e is smaller than zero. Now we're going to look at the case where e is larger than zero. And you can tell that this is going to be a scattering state because if you take a look at the potential, recall that this is a direct delta potential, so you have this infinitely sharp spike that is pointing all the way down to negative infinity, and then it goes back down here. And then if your energy level is larger than zero, so your energy level is going to be above the x-axis, then you can see that as x tends to positive infinity or negative infinity, E is going to be larger than the potential itself, because at these regions, at positive and negative infinity, the potential is actually just equal to zero. So you can see that the energy level is larger than the potential at these two limits. And if this condition is met, then this is you, what you're going to get is a scattering state. So it's kind of like the what you get for the free particle. So with that in mind, let's try to solve the Schrodinger equation for the case where E is larger than zero. So starting off with the Schrodinger equation, we get something very similar to what we got we were solving for the case for the energy level smaller than zero. So we arrive at this expression. So we recall that last time, when the energy level was smaller than zero, we let a constant k be equal to this expression. So the negative is inside because back then the e was smaller than zero. But now the e is going to be larger than zero. So this time around, we're going to define k as being equal to the square root of 2me divided by h bar, so without the negative sign, because e is already positive. So what this means is that this whole entire this whole entire expression is going to become negative k squared xi. And then solving this differential equation, we see that xi is actually equal to a times e to the power of i k x plus b to the power b times e to the power of negative i k x. So this is kind of like the case for the free particle. And uh, in this case over here, I'm first going to consider the case where x is smaller than zero. So we're going to break this up into break up our xi of x into two parts. The parts where it's smaller than zero, where x is larger than zero, and the point where x is equal to zero. So for the point where x is smaller than zero, our xi of x is going to be equal to this. And then pretty much similar to last time, we also uh, look into the region where x is larger than zero, and then we get a similar expression. So xi of x in this region is going to be equal to f times e to the power of positive i k x plus g times e to the power of negative i k x. And so there we have it. So right now, what we have so far, as you can see, it's pretty similar to what we did last time. So for the region where x is larger than 0, we have this expression. So plus b to the power of negative i k x when x is smaller than 0. When x is equal to 0, we still don't know what this is yet. But later on, we will find out using the continuity property and this is what we have when x is larger than zero and I recall that last time we were able to get rid of one of these e terms when we considered the case where x tends to positive and negative infinity so we were able to get rid of one of the terms using the fact that these const uh, these this function has to be normalizable but then for this expression here this is not going to be normalizable in the end if you want to normalize this you're going to have to do something like the Fourier transform, like what we did for the free particle. So we can't use the positive and negative infinite uh, argument to get rid of one of these terms. So we're stuck with the, all these uh, unknowns over here. We have this unknown a, b, f, and g. So we're going to try to use some of the properties of xi of x to try to arrive at our, at our answer. So the first thing we're going to do is that we're going to use the property that xi of x has to be continuous. So this is pretty similar to what we did previously. So we're just going to consider, first of all, the left-hand side limit. So the limit, the left-hand side limit for xi of x is going to be equal to the right-hand limit of xi of x. So the right-hand limit means you tend towards uh, 0 from the positive side. This is where you tend towards uh, 0 from the negative side. And then when you're tending towards 0 from the negative side, you're going to use this expression where it applies when x is smaller than 0. So if you, just, if you just substitute 0 over here, e to the power of 0 is just equal to 1. So we have a plus b on the left-hand side. And then you do the same thing over here. We, we get f plus g on the right-hand side. 
So immediately using the continuity property, we already have one relationship that is going to help us. So the second relationship is we're going to use is what we derived earlier before. So we call that uh, before we integrated the Schrodinger equation itself, and then we arrived at an expression that looks something like this. So this result applies no matter uh, whether your situation you're considering is e is smaller than zero or e is larger than zero. So it applies to both of these situations. So we applied this to this situation in the previous videos, and now we're going to apply this to this situation as well. It applies to both situations. And so if in order to use this expression, we're going to have to try to differentiate this term over here, which is which should be simple enough. So let's get rid of this. And incidentally, because of the continuity property, you can see that at x is equal to 0, this uh, function xi of x must be equal to a plus b in order for this whole thing to be continuous. So it, this could be also be written as f plus g, so it doesn't really matter because both of these are equal anyway. So back to the point, we need to differentiate this term now. So differentiating this, for the region x is smaller than 0, we have i k e to the power of e times uh, e to the power of positive i k x, and then minus i k b e to the power of negative i k x. So this applies for the region x is smaller than 0. When x is equal to 0, the derivative becomes kind of funny, but we don't, uh, it doesn't really concern us because we don't really need to consider the case. Uh, we don't need to find the derivative for uh, this function at x is equal to 0, so we, just, we can just ignore this. And then for the region when x is larger than 0, we just do something similar. We have i k f e to the power of i k x minus i k g e to the power of negative i k x. So this is going to be our derivative. And now we're going to have to substitute our epsilon into this expression, and then we're going to consider the case where epsilon tends towards 0. So you can see that in this case, epsilon is positive, so we're going to be substituting epsilon into this expression, which applies when x is larger than 0. So we get i k f and then minus i k g. So we don't need to write the e term because in the end, epsilon is just going to tend towards 0, and the e term is just going to become 1, so we, we can just ignore it. And then minus, here we need to substitute negative epsilon. So when it's negative, when we're in the negative region, x is smaller than 0, this expression applies. So we have minus i k a, and then we have minus i k b. And all of this is equal to negative 2m alpha divided by h bar squared. And then psi of 0, we call that as just equal to a plus b. So I can just, might as well just put this in here. So now we can group up with some of the like terms. So first of all, I'm going to divide the k over 2 the other side like this. So all these k's, they're going to they're going to disappear from the left-hand side. And then I'm going to I'm going to also divide the i over to the other side. So again, 1 over i over here. And then actually 1 over i is just equal to negative i. You can prove this by multiplying the numerator and denominator by i. So the denominator becomes negative 1, so you get negative i. So by dividing this by i, I can also write this as negative i. So I can just get rid of this negative sign and put the i up here. And then now I'm going to define a constant, beta. I'm going to let this be equal to m alpha divided by k h bar squared. So this is going to save us some time without, so we don't have to write out all these constants every time. So we have 2 beta i e plus b on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, we have f minus g minus a plus b. And with a bit of rearranging, we can see that on the left-hand side, we have f minus g. And then I'm going to group the like terms together. I'm going to dump the a's together. So we get 1 plus 2 beta i a. And for the b term, I have minus 1 minus 2 beta i 